And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. That's right, Greta, you pint-sized antagonist. It is Friday, and this is our own personal Friday protest, The Climate Realism Show, episode 104, Save the Whales, Kill the Turbines. I'm your host, Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute. Joining me today, we have our regular panelists, Dr. H. Sterling Burnett, who is Director of the Robinson Center for Climate at the Heartland Institute, and we also have Linnea Lucan, who is a research fellow with that same outfit. We have with a special guest, Craig Rucker and Terry Johnson of CFAC, and they're going to be talking about something a little bit later, but welcome, guys. Glad you could join us today. Yeah, thanks for having us Glad to be here. Thank you. Great. So on the show today, what we're going to do is explain that to save the whales, we need to kill these large uh, offshore wind projects. These so-called wind farms, particularly on the Atlantic coast, are large and they do more environmental damage than most people realize. Covering the area the size of Connecticut and Rhode Island combined, one project off the mid-Atlantic coast poses a complete risk to the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Now, this is just one of many ocean mammals that are being harassed and killed by these projects due to the sonic vibrations that make it into the ocean. Do you remember a few years ago when people were having a cow over the fact that submarines were using sonar in this area to do some testing? People on the left went berserk over that. You're killing the whales, you're killing the whales. But now that we have these wind turbines going thwomp, 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 thwomp into the ocean, that's okay. It's rank hypocrisy. really is on the left stage. So we're going to get to that issue momentarily, but first we want to start off with crazy climate news, some of the nuttiest, eye-rolling stuff that's been on the internet this week. First, we want to go to this Twitter link. Now, this is from Dr. Ryan Maui. Now, he gives us this fact check. Basically, there's this one guy uh, who's, you know, he's, he's got 224,000 followers because he regurgitates some of the worst climate crap out there. But he, but Ryan Ma is calling him on it. Maui is calling him on it, saying, "Can anyone explain why these climate doomers are losing their minds over a beautiful, warm spring day?" Yeah, look at this. Coming up, seventies, mid seventies. Oh my God, we're gonna roast. It's crazy. But look, if we scroll down a little bit on that on that tweet, we'll see what the guy's original claim is right there. Okay, so here's the guy, Mike um, Hudema. And he's got 224,000 followers. And he puts out this map, you know, which is, of course, is a model map. And look at that. The whole central part of Europe is baking. Climate crisis. Oh, no. Anyway, it's 70 degrees. Nobody's roasting. What do you think about this, guys? I mean, why do these people go so nuts over these maps? Not roasting. Probably some people are outside celebrating and picking flowers and sunbathing. <laughs> I don't know. Some of those, some of those uh, Northern Europeans can get pretty uh, complainy about anything over like sixty-five degrees. I've noticed. Uh, well, there you go. Well, it is France, and it, you know, I don't know how this impacts the wine, but I would think it would be nicer to have your wine and cheese and crackers on a warm day than a cold one. Yeah, it's just nuts. You know, it's like well, any, anything slightly out of the northern area, so slightly warmer than normal spring. It's climate change, death, destruction, raining from the skies. Yeah, but the, que the question is, is it a slightly warmer than normal spring? I mean, the colors he uses make it look, makes it look bad. But my question is, relative to what it is there normally in the spring, uh, is it that much warmer? 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Do you vacation in France in the spring much, uh, Sterling? Uh, no, I was there last year in, in July, but uh, uh, not the spring. Il semble comme un bon météo. The weather sounds good there. <laughs> anyway, our next topic. Taylor Swift and climate change. I love this. Yes, one. there's been quite a number of people who've pointed out that Taylor Swift has a humongous carbon footprint. Maybe the only other larger carbon footprint in terms of celebrities and so forth might be John Kerry, the climate envoy, flying everywhere to give his message of doom and gloom and, and stop building those coal plants while the Indians and the Chinese mm. laugh at it. Well, I think but, Taylor's topped him. I think Taylor's topped him. Might be, might be. I mean, but she's going to co concerts all over the world every day. She's flying somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah she you is. Know, and, and how much is her dating Travis Kelsey added to that in that she has to make it back from her concerts to Kansas City Chiefs games? <laughs> yeah. So here's the bottom line. This study done uh, says that Swift emitted 8,300 metric tons of carbon dioxide, about 1,800 times the average person's annual emission, according to the Carbon Market Watch. A study claimed Swift was the number one celebrity responsible for CO2 emissions in 2022. The study stated she spent nearly 23,000 minutes in the air, about 16 days. And we have a bar chart that kind of shows this, this whole summary of Taylor Swift compared to the rest of the celebrities out there. Um, look at this. Um, I told you, Carrie doesn't even rank. <laughs> uh, you know, it's look. Still, I, I, and that's just that. I, I, I don't know how that happened, but uh, I plead innocent, whatever it is. That, uh, that, 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 that's just her flights. That's not yeah. even counting. And the, the study looked at the carbon footprint from all the vendors and all the materials that are sold at her shows and the energy used uh, in producing her shows. And uh, I think they even tried to account for the vehicles traveled to get to her shows. It's worse than that. So um, now I should, I should, I should say we may be canceled by the Swifties now. I'm sure they're going to come to her defense. And so uh, we may have our show pulled from YouTube because not because of anything we said about climate, but because we've we've uh, said something about Taylor Swift. Yeah. I'm trembling. <laughs> How dare you? Yes. Yeah. Um, was this study, I, I don't have the link in front of me, was this study one that was done by like a university or like a grant receiver? Uh, because I think it's done by just a, an environmental group that's out there doing it. Okay. All right. Urban that's okay then, watch. I guess. I was about to say, because if this is something that like some university threw together really fast, I'm just thinking tax dollars went to this. We're, <laughs> we're actually we're actually spending money to calculate how many emissions uh, celebrities are. Yeah, no, I don't like it. No, this no. Is into account her carbon offset, because a lot of these celebrities say that, you know, yeah, maybe I jet set more, but I'm paying Africans to not develop. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah. So, I'm I'm paying Africans to stay impoverished. So, yeah, I mean, have we have we factored that into the equation? I mean, maybe I, she's I maybe she's carbon neutral. Who knows? I don't think I don't think the study indicates that she's become anywhere near carbon neutral. Though they do what they do is they go about suggesting things she could do to uh, reduce her carbon footprint in the future, like make all the memorabilia just electronic only and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I want to take home an electronic T-shirt. Yeah. Well, if she does a benefit for <laughs> Joe Biden, does that uh, does that also reduce her carbon footprint because she's giving to the most environmentally friendly president? You know, one. I think I think that that in itself is doubling it with all the hot air he puts out. <laughs> uh, wait, oh, listen, that's my cue. Can I add to the climate craziness uh, yeah. discussion right here? So um, there was a presidential order that uh, the, all the agencies followed to put up all these uh, wind uh, facilities off the coast. And uh, the order says this. The order says the United States and the world face a profound climate crisis. We have a narrow moment to pursue action at home and abroad in order to avoid the most catastrophic impact of that crisis and to seize the opportunity for tackling climate change that climate change presents. 
there's little time left to avoid setting the world on a dangerous, potentially catastrophic climate trajectory. So there. Well, if there's no time left, why should we worry about it anymore? <laughs> <laughs> that's right? It. Omar that's, Khayyam, that's, eat, that's eat, drink, right and be merry present, for tomorrow we you. die. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, enough of the Swifties. Here's the headline of the year. Linnea found this one. Oh, my goodness. Climate change is hitting vulnerable Indonesian trans sex workers. <laughs> Gosh, is there nothing that climate change can't do? Uh, well, we don't. We don't have to talk about this one in detail. <laughs> <We're>, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that's this crazy. This is pretty self-explanatory. I, mean, yeah. I think uh, it's it's yet again one of those um, you know world ends uh, women and minorities most affected type of stories. So. Uh, and, you, and you talk about minorities. How much more of a minority can you be than a yeah. Indonesian trans Indonesian sex trans sex worker? Oh, yeah, God. that's pretty. That's a pretty small minority right there. Yeah, well, and there's a lot of. It's not largely a Muslim country. Yeah. I didn't think and, that, and that, that might be the basis of the story too. <laughs> well, read this. I mean, this is the kind of journalism that <laughs> passes for climate change alarm these days. It's Joya uh, but don't, don't scroll, please. Stay. I'm going to read that. Uh, Joya Pathitha, a 43-year-old Indonesian transgender woman, first started to notice the changing weather patterns in the mountain ring city of Bandung were affecting her income as a sex worker since a decade ago. Rainy season was lasting longer, and so she couldn't get out and ply her trade or his trade or whatever, or its trade, uh, <laughs> you know? And, and so it must be climate change, right? Because, gosh, I noticed this in the weather. Weather is not climate. They never seem to get this. <laughs> it's just the, 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 I, I gotta gotta wonder about the reporter. I mean, did they fly somebody over? I mean, the greenhouse emissions of going over to find a trans sex worker in Indonesia. I mean, this just seems like an assignment that uh, you know people trying people to find like well, that. Well, they don't they, they don't have to fly in there anymore, Craig. I mean, because they you know the Climate Alarm Foundations have given so many millions of dollars to the AP and stuff. They've hired people in those, in those countries just to report on climate change. Wow. So okay. if, they, yeah. if they, so if they don't file their reports and the reports aren't alarming, they don't get paid. So they're going to find problems. Believe me. I'm not sure if this is accurate, but people online were saying that this uh, correspondent who wrote the article is one of the um, old vice reporters that got uh, <laughs> laid off, which is a funny joke. I don't think it's true, but that's a pretty that was pretty sharp. I thought. Uh, uh, uh yes. So uh, it where, just sounds like an odd thing to be laid off. If, if you did fly that. over, just saying, you know, I'm going to Indonesia. You know what? To report on the tsunami and Earth? no, to find a trans sex worker who's been laid off from climate yeah, change. To find well, climate change. Odd climate change. assignment. Right. I think I think what ends up happening with a lot of these stories, and, and Sterling probably agrees with me on this because we see it all the time for climate realism, is they have something that they want to write about. So they probably just want to write about like how hard it is to be a trans uh, Indonesian or Indonesian trans uh, prostitute. And uh, and then because they're like they get a certain amount of funding to do climate related stuff they just tie climate to it in order to make the headline so that they can yeah. get the funding for their uh, paper on yeah, it it's, so, it's yeah, not well, about quality it's thing. about quantity maybe they could fly taylor swift over there to do a benefit concert for the for trans, the trans people sex that are in Indonesia. Yeah. having a tough time from climate change just a mm -hmm. thought uh, yeah all right. So uh, the final thing, here's the future of electric vehicles. This is when you can't afford to replace your Tesla battery. <laughs> oh, thank goodness for AI generated imagery these days. Uh, I, I like, like the I, I like the big tires they set it up on. Yeah, off-road. Yeah, that well, this good. is what's going to happen to all the EVs in the western world. Uh, you know, where the owners can't afford to replace the batteries and they get scrapped. They're going to ship them mm. overseas. And then the, the people in the third world countries are going to put big tires and donkeys Every, on them. Yeah, <laughs> everywhere, everywhere, everywhere will be Cuba. Um, the I can't wait for the day when um, the people who do all the hot rod uh, uh, modification 
made it, make them into low riders that have the hydraulic shocks that bump them, bump, bounce them up and down on the street. Uh, when they do that with electric vehicles and those things just explode once they're bouncing around and the battery goes, goes off or they just lose their charge in mid jump and you're stuck. Yeah, it's, it's something else. All right. So that's enough of, of crazy climate news. Let's go on to our main topic. Save the whales and kill the turbines. Now, first we want to ex explore what is the North Atlantic right whale? Uh, and Noah has a nice page on this. And I would point out that if this was called the left whale, the environmentalists <laughs> would care about it, right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the, the right whale got its name because it was the right whale to kill. Uh, because it swam very slowly. It was near the coast of uh, New England. And once you killed it, it floated. So how much more right can you get than that? Uh, and had lots of blubber too. So uh, all of that made it very much the right right whale. And th there's there's where the, uh, the name came from. Uh, that, that, ter Terry, let's point out real quickly, by the way, not just the right whale, but the sperm whale and all the whales that they used to hunt, they were saved by fossil fuels. They were hunted right. for oh, yeah. fuel for, for, for lanterns and other things, other uses. That's why they were hunted. And uh, when oil came along, we no longer needed that stuff, and they started to come back. So they were saved by fossil fuels. Exactly. Uh, yeah, First totally. The left never pays attention to this. Uh, yeah, I mean, if if uh, a, uh, some substitute for whale oil and come along, I mean, there'd be zero whales uh, out nope. there. But fortunately, it did uh, in the 1850s in uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, the whales got a break. Uh, however, this particular species, the right whale, uh, didn't uh, get enough of a break until now when there are only about 350 of them left in the world. Uh, and uh, they're uh, they're in trouble. So let's uh, let's talk about what's actually happening and, and why do we have um, these whale deaths? And and, and well, Craig, if you can kind of give us a background about what's been happening over the past few years and why this is a concern now, um, before, that'll help well, drive I, the discussion. Before we do that, can I just say real quick? You have to understand why the North Atlantic right whale is important. It has been on the endangered species list since the list inception. So since the early 1970s, there are between 320 and 340 uh, total whales in existence, North Atlantic right whales in existence. That number is declining despite efforts to save it for what, 50 years now. Um, and uh, now they're putting more uh, barriers to its continued existence. It's protected by the ESA and the Marine Mammals Protection Act, but they're offering no protection right now. So, Craig, well, take over. Well, according, to this graph here, according to the graph there that we have on that previous image, uh, it seems like the population peaked around 2010. And I would point out that around that same time, that's when these wind projects started really getting going out on the Atlantic. Am I right? You are right. Actually, since 2017, there's been about 40 of them that have been that they found are dead. And even this year alone, there's been four of them uh, that have uh, passed away. Probably a fifth one because the last one was a was a uh, female and likely had a, a calf uh, that will also perish too. A lot of them that perish that do out in the ocean, they don't know about as much uh, unless a ship happens to come across them. They do float, as Terry said, but a lot of them also wash up on the beach. So what wound up happening is that um, there's been a push for offshore wind. It uh, predates actually both uh, it back uh, before Biden, before Trump, going back to Obama. But it really took off in 2017 with the a uh, lot of the Northeastern governors in particular trying to... Uh, uh, project, you know, and get uh, offshore wind in order to handle the climate crisis. Biden, when he came in, made it a real priority by wanting to get um, uh, 30 gigawatts or 30,000 megawatts of offshore in by the year 2030 and uh, made that a, a big priority. So uh, it's, you know, 
They've just gone gangbusters. The problem is that they're putting these wind, offshore wind farms, there's about uh, 20, 30 projects of them, about 15 to 30 miles off the sh shore, right in the lane of about 30 different uh, whale species that go up the coast. The most important one that we talk about is the right whale and because uh, it's the most endangered. And uh, since then, there's just been, even by the uh, government's own standards, a unusual mortality events as whales have been beaching themselves, washing up on shores, it's made news. And uh, a lot of people per uh, perceive that much of the problem is caused by the pile driving and the sonar blasting to map the ocean floor, things that interfere with its sonar navigation uh, that is likely a culprit. The, the, you know, I, I would I would be interested to see when the Scott uh, government, the UK government, first started putting in wind farms off in the in the in the uh, North Sea, because that may correspond with the initial decline, because they've been doing this, they've they've been erecting them for longer than us. They've got a, a big set out there. But, it's well, what's, what's particularly amazing about this particular issue is, of course, many of the green groups. Uh, which made made their, uh, you know, in their heyday were Save the Whales people. You had uh, yeah. Greenpeace and all these other organizations that were out there that uh, that's their raison d'etre. And yeah. uh, today they're silent. They're actually on the side of the wind farms. Many of them actually receive and it's been documented money from them. And in conversations with them, I often ask them, I said, hey, whatever happened to Save the Whales? I've actually personally been told, you know, we get it. We're concerned about the whales, but climate change is a bigger issue. Yeah, Since we're yeah. all going to be wiped out by climate change, if a few species maybe have to go in order for us to take the types of actions such as get renewable energy in and the whales have to bite the dust, a few of them, that may be the price we have to pay to tackle an even greater emergency. And that's but, kind of their logic. But here's the problem. Or illogic. I mean, here's the problem. In law, according to the law, uh, the regulations say, the government's own estimates say that you can't, the right, North Atlantic right whale can't suffer a single additional death above natural mortality in any single year and still be on the path to survival. Not one. 0 0.7, in fact. Um, yeah, seven tenths, right. So that's, that's the law. That should be restraining all activities because the ESA can shut down oil anywhere. It can shut down anything anywhere else but it can't shut down an executive order that Biden has to start building these things. Um, now they claim, Oh, well, we've done necropsies on the four whales. We looked at none of them have had burst eardrums. So it's not the sonar. Now, when I, I actually testified a few years ago on behalf of um, mapping for oil and gas off the Northeast coast. And it was brought up. Oh, what about the North Lincoln? Right? Well, I said, well, you don't have to do the sonar when they're passing through. They migrate. Only do it, but that's not what the wind people are doing. And they're saying the sound doesn't bother them. Now, they do it year round while they're trying to map the floor to see where we can set these things. And they're saying that sound doesn't uh, doesn't bother the whales, except it's the same sound that they said was bothering the whales, would bother the whales if it was oil and gas doing it. Right. In, yeah. in, in the that, end, they say... That's hypocrisy in this. Yeah, in the end, it's not the sound. It, it doesn't have to be the sound, I should say. It's the additional shipping traffic, shipping is the number one known uh, human killer of not just right whales, but all sorts of marine mammals. Um, and so we put additional ships in their way, and the sound is forcing them out of their traditional route into the busiest shipping lane uh, in America. So that, it, it's, it's an indirect, it could be an indirect effect, but they're not accounting for that. Yeah, I want to point out, that the National Institutes of Health published a study called Health Effects Related to Wind Turbine Sound, an update. And this is the effects on humans. And we've seen this time and time again, where someone built a wind farm and the subsonic vibrations that whoomp, 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 that goes on with these wind turbines affects the health and, and not just the, the mental health, but the physical health of people. So why would it not affect another mammal, such as a whale. Well, the left says, oh, no, there's no problem at all. No problem at all. Not being bothered by this. But these same people, these hypocrites out there were saying, as, as Sterling rightly points out, that sonar was bothering and killing these whales before, associated with Navy tests and so forth. 
Um, the hypocrisy is just absolutely rank with the left on this. They're more interested in their green agenda than they are in saving an endangered species, in my opinion. Well, they're, they're, they're more interested in money. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Uh, they've all bought into the notion that we have a climate crisis and therefore uh, we, you need to send us your money to solve the climate crisis. And uh, if the whales get killed out, you know, hey, tough luck. Uh, that's too bad. Uh, of course, that's not what the law says. The Endangered Species Act is very uh, clear on this. Uh, that uh, they're 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 breaking the law, and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to pin that on them when we uh, you know have our court case. Well, Terry, you you can't make a wind omelet if you don't break a few whales. <laughs> Good right. one. Yeah, no, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's true. Uh, they're uh, they're uh, very uh, clearly uh, financially tied into this notion of the uh, the climate crisis. Uh, and uh, it's been hard to uh, get the courts to uh, acknowledge that this is a problem for the world, but we're, we're taking a different approach, which I'll get into in a little bit, but hopefully that's going to work. And, and I might want to add, there's, not, there's other issues. I saw one of the people put up on the screen here while we were talking that it's not just the sonar blasting or the clanging from the pile driving even the operational noise once these things are up and running have many people concerned about what uh, could could be a continuation of uh, problems for whales when you got uh, some 3,000 turbines that are I mean these things are huge 800 850 feet tall uh, I think their propellers go over a thousand feet uh, you're talking about perpetual noise clanging right in up and down the east coast in a uh, in a massive vibration that could put these things off uh, there's other impacts as well uh, there's been studies showing that the zooplankton behind these, it kind of creates a desert uh, effect where the uh, wind turbines uh, change the water temperature, but also have a tendency to kill the other marine life that the uh, that the whales feed on near them as well. So, yeah, the, the study out of Scotland, what it showed, it, A, it, it took oxygen out of the water and, and the, the, the plankton it feeds on, they're not mammals, they actually need the oxygen so it, it deoxygenates or lessens the oxygen in the water it affects where they are so they'll shift and so the whales must shift in addition uh just the just the piles the 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 uh the post and the the floor themselves th th that's creating new obstacles that the whales now have to avoid it's not that they can't do it they have sonar but it why are we creating more obstacles for these whales um uh, they're going to have to use more calories to go around these things in and out of them. You know, they're going to have to become NASCAR drivers. Uh, you know, like, like when you're going in and out of those pylon things, uh, that's what they're going to have to do to, to avoid these dead gum wind turbines where there's less oxygen in the water, where there's less food. And uh, nearby there's that great shipping lane that you're going to be uh, now uh, dining and, and uh, commuting in migrating in. Well, and here's its hypocrisy. You know that if this was offshore oil or gas, yeah. and you had this sort of mortality event going up, an unusual mortality event coming up right during the construction of it, yeah. uh, and you had all these different uh, concerns, they would vet each one of these. Every environmental group would be out there uh, protesting it on their ships and yelling at the crews that are going out there. Uh, but instead, they attack those of us who are saying, whoa, let's do the environmental impact statements and that based on the fact that they say, oh, they're climate denialists and things of that sort. <laughs> they're looking at it wrong. The reason, this is the, this is the consequence of unfounded fears of climate, you know, mm -hmm. ones that you exaggerate it. You do rash things like put in these wind farms that actually do harm animals, potentially anyway, at mm -hmm. least it should be looked at. Well, we know they do birds and bats and other things. Right. Because yeah. you're you're going crazy over these uh, this climate alarmism, which is void of substance on almost every issue. Well, um, it, it's it's wor it's worse than that, Craig. Of course, we wouldn't have gotten to this stage had it been oil and gas or almost anything else. Because we have FOIA requirements, uh, not just I'm sorry, not FOIA requirements. We have uh, NEPA requirements, NEPA. NEPA requirements, and they have to anticipate 
in these NEPA uh, reports what the potential impacts might be. And uh, they have to be pretty far reaching. Those take years, not the months. Uh, you know, any pipeline, think about the years and years it takes to get a simple pipeline done um, because of the NEPA requirements. They, they've largely been waived or they've been, uh, it, it's been very slapdash. And of course, as we know, one of the things that's part of the the new court filing we're doing is they've hidden the information. Dominion Energy, yeah. who is the target of our uh, our lawsuit, has, if you read the report where it says impacts on whales, it basically says, I, I forget the actual wording, but it's like proprietary information uh, redacted. And then you say, well, what are the mitigation measures? And you go to the section on mitigation, proprietary inf uh, business information redacted. You couldn't have that in any other project anywhere. No, It's not proprietary what your impact on the spaces would be. So, so you Craig, couldn't even you yeah. couldn't even have a public a credible trans uh, public comment because there's no transparency on the harm. So Craig, I want to ask you, what would it take in your mind, uh, and Terry too, what would it take in your mind for someone like Noah to finally recognize what seems very obvious to the rest of us? <laughs> I'll take that, Terry, first. <laughs> I would say regime change in November. <laughs> That's what would change it. Uh, uh, they're 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 bought into and their budgets and everything else uh, uh, to this notion of climate crisis and to the notion that you have to build wind. People say farms. I, I really prefer factories because that's what yeah. they are. Building industrial wind facilities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, as long as the direction from the top comes down to the agency said, this is what you will do. That is what they will do. They will do any, I, I've run a federal agency. I know how it works. You do what gets your budget and what gets the budget is uh, buying into this notion of uh, climate crisis. Uh, and uh, therefore it won't change until there's change at the top. Now, in the meantime, in the meantime, I do think we have very good chance of uh, having some kind of court relief uh, that we're bringing right now, it could uh, succeed. Um, it's, uh, you know, one of those things that uh, a little bit depends on what kind of judge we have and so on and so forth. But uh, taking the approach we have is definitely one that meets the letter of the law. It meets the facts uh, and uh, should succeed in stopping this uh, at least until November. And then uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. At the time. You know, um, tell, talk about you, you said what we hope, but talk about what what we're suing over there, Terry or Craig. Explain explain what the lawsuit is requesting. I want to say, by the way, Noah. To be fair, Noah's biologists were very clear that this could be harmful to the whales, and they were ignored by the management. When things like that happened under Trump, when 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 the biologists spoke and uh, Trump officials said, "Ah, we don't care about that." They got sued. Nobody, you know, we're having to sue um, uh, the government here. Well, and I just said, uh, it's what Terry, before he says this, I think another thing that's a big factor in this is the money. You got the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, a lot of this money is finding its way uh, to promote things like offshore wind. You got sweetheart deals that are being made with offshore wind companies. And by the way, most of these are not American companies. They're Avangrid, uh, they're BP from England, they're uh, Orsted, Orsted from Norway, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Equinor. Uh, these are all companies, mostly European companies, that are given uh, just incredible sweetheart deals. For example, uh, they usually do it by the uh, megawatt hour charge. Uh, it would be like $30, $60 if you had a natural gas plant or a coal fired plant or something of that sort. These guys are getting $120, $120 per megawatt hour and they want even a higher net of $177 in the case of uh, New York State's Empire Wind 2 project. So they're getting like double, triple the amount that you would get to produce electricity intermittently because these things generally only operate at full capacity about 35 to 45% of the time. 
And I think the money is also a huge factor. And once that gets chopped off, and as Terry said, with regime change, if it can get chopped off, I think you'll see these things collapse as you have been seeing them collapse um, because they're not sustainable economically without gov an influx of government money and very generous deals by uh, you know, the public utility commissions of the various states. I want to follow up on what you just said. They are already collapsing, Craig. Look, uh, Dominion has the sweetest of sweetheart deals. All the others had to bid in for their projects. They bid in at prices that are five, six times higher than any other source of energy. And the government says, yep, yep, sounds good to us. We don't need onshore wind or solar. We don't need coal or nuclear. No, we need that really, really expensive offshore wind. And so we'll give you five or six times. And then what, what happened was, well, inflation hit, supply chain issues hit, and they can't even make money at five and six times uh, normal rates. And so they're collapsing. Companies are pulling out. They're going bankrupt. They're saying, we're not going to do this project unless you come back and give us even more money. But not Dominion. Dominion was smarter than the rest of them. They said, we're going to finance it all ourselves. All we want you to do is let us pass on any cost we incur to the ratepayer. We don't need to come back to you. We're not bidding in because we're going to, we're going to build it ourselves. Just let us pass yeah. on the cost. So as costs have risen, it just gets piled more and more on the right pair because they got the best sweetheart deal of all. Yeah. Yeah, they, they do. And, and, uh, so I answer your question about, about the lawsuit, uh, what the endangered species act says is when you have a federal action, uh, there needs to be an opinion as to whether this is going to harm endangered species. Uh, and so, uh, what, uh, that the uh, companies have done and what BOEM have done, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has done, is said, okay, we'll take a look at the action. And the action is going to be one little piece of this entire puzzle. And if you put up that map, you'll sh I'll show you uh, that uh, there are 32, there, there they are. There are the 32 wind places that have been uh, established by the government. And uh, what uh, Bohm has said is, oh, well, we'll look at one little piece. We'll look at one little piece at the middle, one little piece at the top, and see if that has uh, some kind of harm to the uh, right whale and to other species. And of course they found, no, it doesn't. Well, the law says you can't do that. You can't uh, determine impact by carving stuff in, in little pieces and thereby understate and under account what the impact is, uh, that's that's wrong. That's a procedural error. And so that's what we're suing on, this procedural error that uh, they committed in looking at this on a piecemeal fashion. Uh, and uh, no other suit has done that before. And so therefore, we think our suit has a good chance of succeeding because it's following the law and following the facts and following logic. People understand that, that you can't take a uh, what something that has 32 pieces to it and pick one little piece and decide that that's going to be the one that you make your determination about impact on. You can't do that. Yeah. Uh, when you so, do a pipeline, uh, when you do a yeah, pipeline so or something, you have to look we'll, at the whole we'll pipeline. Succeed. We'll see. We'll see. We, uh, we filed that, uh, a couple of weeks ago. We're going to move for a preliminary injunction, uh, in about a week. Uh, and that's going to be when we'll really find out if uh, we've got uh, going to be able to get any relief at the courts. Because they start, they they're supposed to start driving piles in May, May first. Right. So we got to stop. We need to stop it before then. At, at least get that stay. While to, like you said, to do one thing, one thing only: comply with the law as it's written, which means the yep. cumulative impact of all these things. Um, but I think you made one mistake when you when you said, Terry, you said, yeah, this one segment doesn't have an impact. No, no, no. Even Dominion's segment. They're having to get take permits, right? Because of level B harassment. Take permits for up to three whales. We can harass up to three whales. Sorry. The harassment is a potential death uh, knell for those three whales because if you harass them, it could disrupt their feeding, their breeding, uh, their transit. It could put them into shipping lanes. Uh, those are all uh, indirect harms which could result in their death. And leaving aside the poor North Atlantic right whale, 
tens of thousands of dolphins, porpoises, and other marine mammals will be affected. And those, they're not endangered species, or at least most of them are not. Uh, but they are still protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and they're giving no protection. They're given no protection whatsoever. So it's not that even this one little segment doesn't have an impact. It does. But cumulatively, it's a disaster. And I would even yeah. add to that, it's, it, you know, it, they, if you do to all these individuals, and they call them level B harassments, where they're not technically allowed to kill them, but they can harass them. But these harassments could, by if you read them, they can make them move into other shipping lanes. So, yes, they can kill them, even though it's a level B harassment that they're authorizing. And secondly, when they did their biological opinion, like take Dominion, an example, they'll say, well, we did do a biological opinion, but they redacted much of what it is when it comes to the right whale. You can't even read. And they're asking for public comment on some of these biological opinions. And and they cover up everything that deals with what sort of mitigation they're going to do or what are the potential impacts to the right whale. So the public doesn't even see them. So one of the other things we're doing uh, is to trying to get that, you know, opened up so we can actually read what the biological opinion says in its full. Yeah, we followed it. the second the second part of the of what we're doing right now. The first thing is we're trying to get a, a stay while they conduct a, a, a real uh, environmental impact assessment for the whales. But the, the second thing is we're trying to get we we're filing a freedom. We're about to file a Freedom of Information Act request for the hidden information. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's one thing to say that there's uh, no impact, and then there's another thing to say, well, we won't tell you why we even think there's no impact, yeah. uh, because uh, we're de redacting it and, and declaring it to be proprietary and confidential, uh, which is uh, yeah, it's, it, just another layer of absurdity this whole thing. It's like them saying, trust us. Uh, we really, really promise there's no impact on the whales. You don't need to, you know, don't look behind the curtain, you know, ignore the data behind the curtain. Um, yeah, yeah, double swear, you know, finger pinky swear. It's uh, exactly. it's absolutely not, no problem, no problem. I, I uh, can't even imagine, I can't even imagine what could be proprietary about an impact. Are they in judging the impact? Are they saying something about? how their technology is so different from every other kind of technology that even talking about the potential impact would dis would disclose proprietary commercial information? Because that's basically what they're claiming. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a little more, I don't know how you put it, skeptical of the whole thing. I think that they, they did uncover some stuff, and I think they're afraid to um, release it to the public. Uh, another reason these companies are going bankrupt uh, to a degree is they are – facing significant grassroots opposition, not just from, you know, groups that might be considered climate realists or skeptics like us who have been raising the alarm about it, but many even on the political left. Uh, we've staged some uh, boat protests and, and uh, you know, street theater on the beaches. And a lot of the people who participate are people that would be ideologically opposed. I'm more conservative. They'd be more on the liberal side uh, opposed to this. And they've been launching their own lawsuits and they've been filing their own complaints as well. And this is delaying the process in many cases and also adding to the expense to a degree for these companies. And I think that uh, it's been kind of refreshing that uh, uh, Biden and the offshore wind industry is actually bringing right and left together against the Biden offshore wind policy. So uh, my hope is, is that we'll see this continue and they will open this up because I think they're afraid to show it. Uh, because it'll just open them up to more criticism from the grassroots groups that are already upset. Every time a, a, a whale beaches itself or is found dead, again, it just uh, it just captures the news and rekindles the fires of people that are very upset about this all up and down the coast. Let's talk about one of the things they did as a pre... Oh, I'm sorry. Linnea, you want to... Oh, uh, I was just going to bring up real quick. Uh, we have a very nice super chat from one of our viewers with a nice compliment. Great show again today, guys. Very appreciated. Uh, well, we appreciate you, Dean. So thank you. Yep. Right. And I would add I was... that 10 pounds that we got is nothing compared to the claims that we get money from big oil, which we never do. <laughs> uh, we don't either. 
Uh, one yeah, can wish. Anthony, where, I'm where waiting for that, that check. Where's that money? I've been waiting. I've been looking in my mailbox every, every day. Uh, it, there's and there's no checks, mm. no money. It's uh, I'm getting discouraged that we're going to get any oil and and gas money. Uh, but I just want to hey, look. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm just you know not looking in the right place. I don't know. Could talk. I want to talk about precursor to these things. Uh, there have been objections from coastal communities for a long time against this stuff. Even Democratic one, you know, ones with Democratic city councils, Democratic uh, boards of governors and and, gov and mayors. And uh, to avoid all that, the states conveniently pass laws saying locals, locals can't stop these projects. Yeah. So yeah. they're having all these impacts. People on shore are complaining, even in the in the pre staging when they're constructing these things, when they're building transfer stations for the power, when they're running the lines across their land, they're losing their rights left and right. Uh, the, the, you know, the tourism bureaus are very upset. The people who live near shore are complaining about noise already when they're just pre-constructing some of these things. But that's all been voided by state governments buying into Biden's climate alarmism and and basically, more importantly, Biden's big money funnel. You well, know, about the noise thing, though, I would be curious to hear from some of the people who live in like off um, in like Scotland and uh, near some of those offshore wind facilities, because water carries sound pretty significantly. You know, if you live anywhere near like a lake or anything, you know that someone could be just like chatting on the other side of the lake at a normal sound level and you'll be able to hear them crystal clear. So I'd be curious to know if the impacts of sound from wind turbines are, if they're actually worse uh, if you live like in a beach house near one of these installations. Yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, Sterling's right that uh, the uh, the noise already from uh, onshore construction that's got to be done in order to facilitate uh, the offshore. I mean, just think about offshore. You've got not just the offshore uh, uh, monopiles, but you've got all the rock that needs to go around them and all the cables that need to connect the offshore to the, the uh, onshore, and then the substations that need to be put in. I mean, it, it's just it's just a massive complex. Uh, and uh, even the onshore people now are saying, uh, well, wait a second, you know, we, we, we don't, we didn't buy into this. And in Virginia, it's very interesting that there's a separate line now for the uh, costs that are gonna be paid by the consumer, by the ratepayer for this for the wind projects it, it that's only appeared about the last year and it's going to be interesting to see as that number goes up and up whether people are going to begin to say wait a minute uh you told us that this was going to be really good and cost-free and everything else and now i gotta pay another 10 bucks a month what, what are you talking about so uh it's 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 uh it's something that's i think going to ultimately possibly implode on itself but in the meantime we've got to stop what they're doing right now and that's that's why we're bringing the lawsuit you know a couple of things i'm sorry i was going to say terry uh, uh brings it we got to stop it for right now i'll tell you they're getting creative with how they're trying to buy off the public uh, and a number of communities were getting word uh, particularly in the uh massachusetts and rhode island area but also in new york uh they're making donations to local governments to help them oh, yeah. uh, educate their people. They're having town hall meetings with the fishermen who are very concerned about this could be the death knell of their industry uh, as the offshore wind is something they're very opposed to, but they are getting money. Some of them are by the uh, offshore wind industry to um, compensate them for potential losses to their catch as a result of these wind farms. So uh, they're busy at work trying to pay off people and uh, even some of the environmental groups uh, to get to make sure, because this is a big cash cow to them. They get these wind farms in, uh, rate payers will get harmed, but the uh, companies will rake in. And you look at countries like Denmark, for example, big on wind energy. They're paying about 35 cents, 40 cents a kilowatt hour. In America, it's about 10, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Their rates are three, four times higher than what we're paying. And a lot, you know, renewable energy is not ready for prime time. It's always been way more expensive and less reliable. I would say, you know, we it's not a part of the lawsuit. Uh, it, it's not a part of the things that when I put in my public comments on this. But since uh, I put in my public comments, it's we've become aware of the fact that these wind turbines are shredding. 
in, in Scotland, they, the, the, the edges are being shredded by the wind action. And so microplastics are going everywhere. And, and supposedly the environmentalists care about microplastics. I hear a lot about microplastics and the great ocean plastic problem. Um, this is going to be putting microplastics all over into the oceans, which will be fed on by the fish and, you know, enter the food chain, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but they don't care about that. In addition, uh, some people <coughs> here in the U.S. may have noticed we get some hurricanes on the uh, east coast of the United States. <coughs> it's unclear to me how well these wind turbines are going to hold up to hurricane force winds. Yeah, I want to point out that the namesake that we've been talking about, Save the Whales, there's actually an organization called SaveTheWhales.org, and they have a whole section on concerns of, of their organization on wind farm proposals, yeah. and they go through all of the different points in this. Now, when an organization like SaveTheWhales.org steps up and says wind farms are a problem, you would think someone would stand up and listen. But these people over, uh, you know, on the left who are pushing their agenda don't seem to care. And that's why at the beginning of this show, I've called this whole issue rank hypocrisy on the part of the left and the part of the climate agenda people. Except, except for the... Except for Greenpeace, which used to be a big whale group, that was that, that and nuclear was why it, why they started. All the whale groups, the groups that are specifically focused on protecting sea mammals and whales, they are have filed that ten of them filed letters opposing and saying you need to study this more. All the main main environmental groups, which are getting money from Big Wind, which are concerned about climate change more than anything. They are supporting these things. So if you're concerned about whales, the whale groups are against it. The environmental groups, they, they don't care about the whales. Right. Okay. So we've kind of uh, talked this out. Now we're going to go to our question and answer period. And Linnea, take it away. Sure thing. Um, okay. So we have a, a couple of good questions here today. First, let's pull up um, right here. All right. When the offshore wind farms eventually prove useless, who will remove them? I think they'll be left to rot. And I can comment on that. So this is actually one of the problems about wind that's not really a problem. Like, it, I mean, it depends. It depends on how they do it. So usually what they do for like semi-permanent um, offshore oil platforms, like production platforms, is they cut them off at a certain distance mm -hmm. underneath the waterline and then they sink the whole thing because it creates an artificial reef structure and it's actually can be very beneficial for that kind of structure to exist. And if it's not running anymore, it's not causing any kind of vibrational disturbances or anything. So a lot of animals will probably colonize those, um, you know, kind of uh, rotted out holes as long as they take out, you know, the like fluids and stuff that are in there, which I'm sure they would. So that's not something that I'm overly concerned about I would be curious to know if they have to actively keep critters like barnacles and stuff from growing on those pylons, if that ends up being a problem for them or not. Um, and then I also want to mention, as long as we're on this topic regarding hurricanes, I'm not overly worried about these things getting ripped apart by hurricanes. And my justification for that is that they have them in the North Sea and as far as I can tell, they're not getting like wholesale torn apart by the wave action there, which can be very extreme, uh, even when there isn't a major storm coming through. So I'm not too worried about the structural um, competency, I guess, of the uh, wind turbines. I think the major problem here is just the disturbances, the fact that it's not a good energy source to begin with, um, and the sound issue. Well, the wave, the wave thing is one thing, but the wind thing is another. And we do know that winds knock down turbines across Europe and in America on occasion when they're supposed to flutter, when they're supposed to shut down, and they don't because the gears break, the brakes break, or uh, even when they are shut down. And the North Sea doesn't often get Class 5 hurricanes or Class 4 hurricanes. They may get high winds low hurricane force winds, but I doubt that they get some of the hurricanes we get in the uh, up and down the Atlantic coast. As far as um, 
the decommissioning on land in Hawaii and in California, you're just seeing these things rot. When they break, they just sit yep. there and rot. I've, I've been to South Point, anything. Hawaii, and I can tell you you're exactly right. They leave a whole bunch of these wind turbines yeah. on South yeah. Point, Hawaii, and they've been left there to rot for you know, yeah. over a decade or more. They just rot. Now, maybe they'll have to do something in the ocean. I, I don't know. Uh, you may know more about this, Linnea, but um, oil platforms are mostly, I would guess, steel and metal not microplastics and plastics and, and graphite. And, and that's what these things are made of. They're not made yeah. for the most part of steel and things. And so I don't know how well, um, first off, do you want to dump tons of plastic in the ocean? I'm told we don't. I'm told that <laughs> that's a terrible thing. Um, well, so are we just going to come down and put a big... <laughs> My well, guess. We are, I mean, we've, we've done glass, stuff with seat back at offshore platforms, and they are good, especially in shallow waters. And I'm, I agree with you in biodiversity. Just so you are aware, though, the and you know this, of course, the Greens are opposed to that. They've always wanted them <laughs> torn up because they said these platforms were awful in the ocean and need to be yeah. decommissioned. And we've made the argument that actually they are good for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. The uh, will the Greens actually change course here? And when it comes to wind farms, all of a sudden agree with us and say, maybe you should chop them below the water. That's OK. We're with you. What you're saying. I don't know about that because they are talking about recycling these things. And the unfortunate thing is a lot of the wind parts, including the propellers, are made with components that don't recycle easy. They can't be recycled. Right. Right. So they're well, going to landfills and uh, and they're clogging them up, as the L.A. Times recently mentioned, all the solar panel, wind farm stuff. This is the liberal L.A. Times talking about it becoming a problem in California because they've been at wind energy for a long time. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and certainly they're not going to sink the like fiberglass parts of it because it, you know, that that wouldn't make any sense at all. But I just mean in terms of the like concrete uh, foundational structures and stuff, I'm sure they'll leave them. And I'm not sure that that's like a terrible thing, I but um, the uh, yeah, I if they do end up just like leaving them above the water line, sitting there dead forever, and they just keep building new ones, that would be, man, what a good representation of modern environmentalism, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so okay, here's uh, here's another question. We've got how does offshore wind at 25 cents a kilowatt hour lead to lower energy bills? 25 cents would be cheap for offshore. Yeah, water. that's that's actually cheap. That's it's yeah. higher than that. Yeah, Much higher than I would that. say it doesn't. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah, doesn't lower it, energy it bills. They don't the they don't claim it will. What they claim is it's got to be done to fight climate change. It, it's cheaper to build onshore wind, it's cheaper to build onshore solar. I mean, as bad as those things are, that's cheaper. This is just where they can get the most money. Yeah. Well, the next well, step is off off the planet wind and solar. <laughs> oh that would be geoengineering yeah. we don't we can't have that <laughs> all right this one's kind of a funny one just for fun i liked this uh so i'm putting it up aren't there some hippies who think dolphins are like star seeds or something what do the dolphins have to say about the windmills i think i think translated that was i object yeah <laughs> No, yeah. that's okay. the problem. The dolphins and the porpoises, if you look at these, if you look at just what we can read in the government's own documents, for them, they're talking about thousands of them being affected and possibly killed by these things. Yeah. It's not It's not just thousands. there will be a few North Atlantic right whales, thousands of dolphins and porpoises and hundreds of other types of whales and, and sea mammals will be impacted. Yes. Yep. And this is this kind of expands on that. This is referring to earlier when we were talking about the number of whales that have been killed. This person asks, is that per station? And the answer to that is no. It's not three whales per wind turbine, but it's it's per the project, which is a hundred, which I think is 176 for Dominions. Right. Yeah. Uh well, we're talking about whales that have been killed before they've even erected the first uh monopile. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're doing the, the sonar mapping of the floor, which is sonar blasting of the floor. And uh, these animals, especially right whales, they, they live and die by sound. Uh, they don't see very well and live and die by sound. You interfere with their sound, you, you're killing them. Uh, and that's what's going to happen 
uh, if these things get built, but uh, not good. Hopefully that won't happen if we succeed legally. All right. If tax credits were removed, what is the financial viability of these wind projects? <laughs> you can actually yeah. Yeah, you just go to the companies. The companies themselves say unless they get these tax credits, unless they are able to get the uh, uh, price per uh, you know kilowatt hour or the price per megawatt hour that they're asking for, which is three times higher than regular electricity, they can't make it. And they're pulling, they're paying bucks in many cases to get out of here. I think it was BP and Equinor paid, what was it, $40 million to break a contract. Yeah, I, think, I think Orsted's paying to break its contract as well. I, yeah. One of them, so you're one of them that they're paying big bucks to get out of the contract unless they can get the tax credits and everything else, you know, because it's a, it's a loser unless they get the financial the, arrangement. The, these, these projects live and die on subsidies. You take care of the subsidies, they, they collapse. Uh, and that's, by the way, to be fair, that's true of onshore wind and solar as well. Yeah. It, yeah, it, probably, it, yeah every year, onshore. every yeah. year, uh, when you got these omnibus bills coming, because we never get our budgets done, right? Uh, if the tax credit for wind, the onshore wind, lapses, factories shut down the day after it lapses until the omnibus is passed that re-ups it. Now, on, offshore wind, the most expensive form of electric power I think except for batteries, batteries may be more expensive. Um, these projects wouldn't exist, but for Biden pushing it and Biden's pushing it with dollars. States are getting dollars. And how are they? Uh, it's not just tax credits. It's them passing along the bill to rate payers. It's not just that me and Texas are subsidizing these projects offshore wind through my through tax credits. It's that in Virginia, Whatever Dominion does, they just get to pass it on to their ratepayers. If, if, if no other utility, I'm sorry, I in, in Texas, there's not a single utility in Texas that can just say, "Can we pass on any costs that we have on to ratepayers, regardless of what it is?" Uh, no, you don't get to do that anywhere else. In Dominion, in, in Virginia, does they don't get to do that in any of the other wind farms? They had to bid in, and now they're getting out. And it's, it's not like they're providing power constantly all up and down. I mean, these projects go from the Carolinas up to Massachusetts. You got all these states buying into it. If you were to cumulatively take how much electricity they're all going to produce within a year, you couldn't power all these states. You could only power maybe one of them, New York State, for half a year. And that's the best you could do. So it augments. It's not replacing anything. And you will need back backup gas and coal or, or nuclear or something to back it up because it, even despite all the costs and everything, it's still not going to provide a huge amount of the energy needs for the uh, states up and down the coast. Yeah. And it goes, it goes farther than Massachusetts. It goes up to Maine because uh, Maine yeah. has already got some, some turbines they put in experimentally and uh, they're bucking for more or they were. Uh, it'd some be people interesting to see how they it. do in a Maine winter, you know, yeah, well, a main winner, and you know who's fighting it there. the The lead fight there is the lobster fishermen. Yeah, true. Yeah, we were just contacted by a state legislator who is organizing. A lot of the Native Americans don't like it either because they're uh, going to be using as a jump point in Maine some pristine wilderness area that they want to develop, <laughs> which is actually kind of contradictory. Rather than using an already developed area of Maine, not that there's a whole lot of them, they actually want to use a an area that's kind of pristine and known for that uh, to use as a construction site to get these things up there. That'll be interesting to see because there you have a conflict within the Biden administration's own push because they're pushing offshore wind, but they're also pushing to include Native Americans and minority communities. You know, it's environmental justice in every project. And so if this is um, undermining, it, it seems to me one part of his plan is undermining another. So we'll see how the conflict plays out there. Yeah. We'll just see where, what, what goal is higher on the hierarchy? That's all. Um, yeah, and don't don't forget the Asian trans sex workers too. They they yeah. need to be. Yeah, and what does Taylor Swift think of all these things? <laughs> okay, so we have one more question, but it's a little bit off topic. But I think we could probably give a little bit of information about this. So this is uh, any news on Mark Stein's appeal? Well, I can answer part of this. Um, if you go on his website, I think the last time that he posted something about it was March 10th. 
and they have um, him and his lawyers have a pl uh, brought forward a couple of um, motions. So they have a motion to stay execution of the judgment, which is them complaining about the uh, million dollar punitive damages. They have a motion for judgment as a matter of law and a motion for a new trial. So they are awaiting, I believe, the results of those. Yeah, the judge, the second motion you mentioned, motion for judgment as a matter of law. I, I think the the judge never should have let the court the, the court hear the case. But once he did, um, since they came back with almost no damage, no actual damages, I think he should dismiss it as a, a, a judgment of, you know, a dismissal of the court, not notwithstanding the judgment of the jury, because it'll largely be in, in line with the judgment of the jury, which is there were no damages. <laughs> so, um, but they send a message, but they haven't done that yet. He had the, proud the to, court proud hasn't to ruled. Say, proud to say I'm a founding member of the Mark Stein club. He's <clears> one of the right, best good for you. Good for you. All right. I think that pretty well wraps it up for us today. We've discussed right whales, left whales, up and down whales, whales everywhere. And the hypocrisy of the left in not saving the whales is fairly obvious here. So I want to thank all of our guests uh, from CFAC, uh, Terry and Craig, and of course, Linnea and Dr. Burnett for their discussions and, and commentary today. I want to remind you all to visit our websites that we have new information on regularly. Climate at a glance.com, which have a new post up there today uh, about global wildfires, which will be useful in the coming months. And there's plenty of other information on there that you can use to refute the insanity when you're online or writing letters to the editor or giving talks. And I encourage you to do so. There's also climaterealism.com, where we take the media down every day, every day. We point out the insanity of some of the claims made in the media about climate, and we back it up with facts. And then, of course, there's energyataglance.com, which talks about all these different issues, wind power, solar power, and so forth and so on, and the folly of some of them. And then, of course, my own personal website, whatsupwiththat.com. Be sure to visit all of these websites for the best ammunition you can possibly get in order to refute the climate insanity out there. So I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute. Thanking you all for being here, and of course our viewers too. Wishing you all a great Friday and a fantastic <laughs> weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks for having us. He's a lion, dog-faced pony, so...